When most people think of the Justice League, they usually think of the JLA from the comics, the Justice League cartoon series, or even the Zack Snyder multi-part film. But I can guarantee next to nobody thinks about 1997's Justice League. Nor should they. Just imagine a Justice League movie so bad that it actively makes you nostalgic for Joss Whedon's terrible take on the brand. That's what we're dealing with here. Now, I haven't seen all of the Justice League movies, but I am very confident in calling this one the very worst. Because quite frankly, the brand could not sink to a lower depth than this. I want you to imagine the Justice League just for a moment. Who do you think of? Probably Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, the Trinity, the Founding Fathers and Mother of the Justice League. Their most famous figures, right? Well, all of them are missing for this made-for-TV movie-slash-pilot. Don't expect to see Aquaman here either, though I don't know too many people are shedding too many tears over that one. While the start of this would-be series was kind enough to give us the likes of Green Lantern, The Flash, and Martian Manhunter, the rest of the team is made up of Fire, Ice, and the Atom, who, with all due respect, aren't exactly A-listers. Actually, they're not even really B- or C-listers either. These are some of the most lesser-known, lesser-loved members the team has ever seen. And yes, the Atom has since regained some popularity since then, but it doesn't dismiss the fact that no one was clamoring to see the character on screen at the time. There is just so much to hate about this one. There's so very little of what potential fans of the product would like. The costumes are goofy looking, the effects were laughable even for the time, and the character depictions are way off. If you were a fan of the comic characters, you probably wouldn't be a fan of this show. And even if you knew nothing about any of these characters, after watching this, you'd probably hope to keep it that way. We're talking about a product so bad that some of the people working behind the scenes on it had asked to have their names taken off of the project. When people who are putting in work on something don't want to be credited for said work, that's probably not a great sign. At the time, critics called this pilot Friends with Superpowers. And I can see what they mean by that. A lot of effort went into trying to make these characters relatable for 90s audiences, rather than properly portraying the characters from the comics. And yes, they were definitely trying to copy what they saw on TV and what was popular at the time. But with the benefit of hindsight, I would say that this is much closer to The Office, but with cosplay. Yes, this show predates that one. I'm not saying that that's what they were intentionally trying to emulate. I'm just saying that there's probably a better comparison to be made there. The show is shot in a work setting, even if that particular job isn't your everyday office space. And we're even given talking headshots of the characters throughout, as if they were taking part in some sort of documentary. Except they aren't. The show isn't filmed as if these heroes are being recorded in their work lives, and I think it would be a mistake on their part if it was. But we're given these glimpses into their personalities and feelings about scenarios in these random throwaway shots that don't seem to have any significance to the actual plot at hand. I understand that Parks and Recreation did this as well, with the show not being filmed as a mockumentary but carrying over the aesthetic from The Office. But Parks and Rec, this is not. It's a lot less forgivable, a lot more jarring, and a lot less entertaining here. These scenes somehow managed to stand out from the absurdity of everything else, and not in a good way. Because not only do they already feel out of place as is, but what they're saying feels out of place in the plot. These random interjections don't add anything to what's going on. More often than not, they're just the characters saying spontaneous other times, they're giving antidotes about moments that have never happened on screen. And at other times, they're just overly repetitive, getting the same point across time and time again. Sometimes, basically recycling the same dialogue. Sometimes, basically recycling the same dialogue. Like that. I mean, I understand that anything made in the late 90s is obviously gonna feel dated in the 2020s. But if I had caught this in 97, even then I'd feel like it was incredibly off. It was made in 1997, but it feels like it could have been made in 1987. The tone is so camptastic that it would make Adam West blush. 
Once again, I get that this was made in 1997, the same year that Batman and Robin was released, but did we not learn our lesson from that one? It's crazy to think that the cartoons handled the material with much more dignity than this live-action iteration. You'd think that having live-action adult actors in the parts would lend to much more real adult-oriented material, or at least a little bit less childish-oriented material, but no. And the tone makes it that much more bizarre when the show uses words like which it does. It doesn't match the tone that already doesn't match the tone of what it was they were trying to interpret. This was probably the least faithful adaptation of the superpowered team that I've ever seen. Not only are these not accurate portrayals, but in a lot of cases, these characters are shallow stereotypes that have no depth to them whatsoever. Case in point, the Atom. He is nerd. That is his character. Goofy hair, glasses, a sleeveless vest over a white shirt, and a bow tie. He's not even a person. He is nerd. That is all there is to him. He acts exactly the way that you think he'd act by taking one good look at him. Judge this book by its cover because that's all there is to it. He is all brain. And the Flash in this is all no brain. Here, Barry Allen is the Flash, but he's completely unrecognizable. I'm not just talking about his appearance, either. Gone is his genius intellect and knowledge of tech and science. And in its place is your average Joe on a downhill slope. He's an unemployed schlub. As a matter of fact, his alleged lack of intelligence is actually brought up in the movie. It just doesn't come as easy for me as it does for you guys. And Ray here is oozing with brains. He could probably do whatever he wanted. But me, what are my special skills? That is not only incorrect, that is a blatant slap in the face to the character. His intellect is integral to his identity. Y here, y you're just making him Joey Tribbiani. He also carelessly uses his powers outside of costume in public, and yet no one is none the wiser, even in moments where it seems obvious that somebody would be clued into something going on. The Green Lantern seems to be an amalgamation of all the mainstay lanterns that had been out at the time. He's named Guy Garner, but he resembles Hal Jordan and Kyle Renner. He has the mask and gauntlet of Kyle, the vest of Guy, and the personality of Hal. Also, through small details, we can see that he shares the backstory of Hal Jordan, what with being an Air Force pilot and all. It's really a, a charcuterie board of Lantern Corps. Martian Manhunter looks like pure nightmare fuel. He's kept off screen most of the time, not for a big reveal, but instead just to keep the makeup budget down. The reason is given that he has limited time in human form, but that's actually not the case. Martian Manhunter doesn't have a problem being a human. He has a problem with being set on fire, but outside of that, he, he's, he's good. His voice is heard, and he's shown disguised as other humans throughout. But Martian Manhunter himself doesn't reveal himself until almost an hour into this hour and 21 minute movie. Admittedly, I don't have a vast knowledge of the characters Fire and Ice. They aren't featured in a lot of the Justice League stories that I've read, and even when they were, they weren't a giant fixture in them. They were just kind of there. In this, Ice is depicted as an overly anxious mess of a woman. She's constantly uneased and fidgety. It's almost like nervousness is her only character trait. Probably because it is. She is stress personified. Fire enjoys the finer things in life but most don't live up to her expectations. Credit to the actress who was playing the part, because this could easily make her come off as stuck up and snobby, but I think she dials it back just enough to make the character almost likable. Or, as almost likable as anybody could possibly be in this. Fire and Lantern seem to have some past relationship that gets referenced every now and again, and I can only imagine that that plot point exists because of their name correlation. Somebody thought they were doing something clever. But I can assure you, after having sat through this, there is absolutely nothing clever throughout. No one cast here was going to be winning any awards for their part. Though for one cast member, this wouldn't be the last time they played that part. Interestingly enough, Miguel Ferrer portrayed the part of Weather Wizard, a role he'd reprise on Superman the Animated Series. I'm going to be real with you, I'm actually glad that he got another chance at the character, because quite frankly, he was the one part of the movie that I almost liked. He has the right voice for villainy. And I also think the actor has a really menacing look to him. 
And you know what? It actually worked. His costume could use a little work, but hey, so could everyone else's. The flesh, his ears are way off, like he's trying to look like a colorful Dark Knight. Martian Manhunter looks like a hybrid between the mask and the main villain from the mask. And the Green Lantern looks like Baby's first Comic-Con. The movie showcases the weather wizard running rampant over Metro City, creating unpredicted storms and tornadoes in a moment's notice. The Justice League must band together to find out who this weatherman gone rogue is and stop him at any cost. While I will credit this TV movie as showing off the detective work the team would have to do, something that gets lost in translation every now and again, but I also have to fault it because for the most part, it seems like they're less interested in what they're adapting and more interested in turning it into something else. A lot less emphasis is put on the heroes and villains, as a spotlight is put on the characters outside of their costumes and in their day-to-day -day lives. It was less concerned with showing hero work and much more concerned with showing how being a hero can affect a person. We see Barry attempting to not get too used to being a bum and just being a happy-go-lucky unlucky goof. Fire is an aspiring actress who's having a hard time finding a part worthwhile. Guy is going through relationship issues with his girlfriend. The Adam and Ice find comfort in their shared awkwardness leading to flirtations of a future between the two. That's really where the meat of this movie is. And I'm sure a lot of that has to do with saving on budget, you know, showing off powers on a TV budget probably isn't the easiest thing to do, especially in 1997 with limited technology. So you know what's a good alternative to that? Not making this show. Doing anything else. Make a sitcom. Make any other sitcom. There's just so many goofy moments that bear mentioning, but go by so quick in passing. So much questionable stuff going on here. We're shown Ice's origins, and I don't even know how to properly articulate how she gets her powers in this, so let me just show you. Did you get any of that? And now she can turn water into ice. Yeah, I, I don't know about this one, Elsa. Guy's relationship with Clueless Girl is pretty strange. I call her that both because she was in the movie Clueless, and also because her character exemplifies that movie's name. Guy is shown serenading his girlfriend by singing her favorite opera for her at dinner. As you do. That's not really important, but I, I just I couldn't let that moment go unmentioned. They have the classic hero romance problem. She wants her man to be there, but he's too busy running off and saving the world. Because he hasn't shared a secret with her just yet, she's left thinking that she's dating an uncaring jerk. Except he literally runs off and shows back up a second later to save her. And she can't figure out that these two are one and the same? Yeah, that mask isn't really doing a whole lot to conceal his identity. He's not even putting on a voice, that's just him in costume. You looked him in the eyes a millisecond ago, and you're doing it right now again, yet you can't figure out that this is a case of dual identity? I mean, there is suspension of disbelief, and then there is... whatever this is. The weatherman's identity is also hardly a mystery. Even with the red herring the pilot pushes on us, it's not fooling anybody. Having the character issue threats on the side of city buildings like he was a wrestler cutting a promo on a titantron was certainly an interesting choice. Uh, not a good one, but, but interesting. Martian Manhunter chose to take on the identity of the Weather Wizard upon greeting Ice in the Justice League headquarters, thus scaring the crap out of her. Again, it seems like a strange choice, especially when she just had an altercation with this villain who was once her boss. There's literally no reason to do this. I get that it's to show that they'd interacted before when he was already disguised as her former employer in a previous scene, but you could have just said that to her instead of scaring her half to death. There's this guy, the kid from the Addams Family sequel, and he's basically stalking fire in her personal life. But it's okay, because he's doing it in a quirky way. Anyway, he doesn't mind her constantly rejecting his advances because he knows he can win her love. So he buys her gifts to show his worth and tries to impress her with his culinary skills. But it's through these gifts that he's able to figure out her identity, as Fire just so happens to be wearing the same set of earrings that he bought her. That's really how you're gonna figure out her identity? Everything else about her appearance, that's just, that's just not a tip-off to you? She's not even wearing a mask, she just put on green eyeliner. Like, I, all right, okay, fine. What's really weird about their nomads, though, is that while Martin is smitten with her, she obviously has an issue with his age. Which, by the way, we're never told how old he is. He claims to be 22, 
but that shut down immediately and laughed off. So he's obviously younger than that. However old he is, Fire still attempts to give him a chance, until ultimately she decides that he's too young for her. Then the episode ends with her saying that he's now dating a 16-year-old cheerleader. So, is she weird for giving this young guy a chance, or is he weird for dating a high schooler? I don't know. You figure it out. Yeah, I'm not gonna touch that. <laughs> a second later, Ice asked what they would have done to her if she didn't agree to join the team after they revealed their identities. To which the Adam says, What would you have done if I'd said no? I mean, I know who you all are. Don't ask. <laughs> okay, yeah, th that that's concerning. The whole thing feels out of whack. The cutaways show Ice and Adam joking about their use of powers, describing a prank that they pulled using her abilities. But then we cut back to the plot at hand, and she's unable to utilize her abilities at will. So where do these headshots take place in? I don't know! But I think the weirdest part of this pilot is hearing the team refer to themselves as the Justice League. Missing the vast majority of the team's original members, the core four, just feels wrong. It almost feels like they're the Justice League's B team, the minor league of the Super Friends. I don't know, the whole thing is just bizarre and doesn't work on any level. Almost always, I end these videos urging my viewers to go out and look at the projects for themselves. But this is the one time I'm gonna advise you not to do that. This is a waste of your time and patience. There is nothing noteworthy or interesting here. This isn't a case of missed opportunity or a diamond in the rough that never got to shine or any unearthed potential. It's not even something that's so bad it's good. This is bad. Uh, just bad. Completely without merit. Without a shadow of a doubt, this is the worst Justice League there's ever been and if we're lucky, the worst Justice League there will ever be. The Adventures of Superman was a beloved series that brought Superman to the small screen. Families would gather around to watch in awe as the definitive superhero soared through the skies, ran through walls, and saved the day. When that series came to an unfortunate end, as did the life of its lead, producers scrambled to find a way to continue the brand without the face of that brand. Their first idea of doing so was spinning the show off to focus on Jimmy Olsen, with Superman appearing in the background utilizing stock footage and stunt doubles. Luckily, the actor portraying the part nixed the idea and sent the studios back to the drawing board. There, two concepts were created. Two Superman spin-offs made from the ribs of the original series, both of which didn't make it past their pilot. The first of which being The Adventures of Super Pup, a would-be show that I've covered here before on the channel. Feel free to check out that video if you haven't already. And the other of which being The Adventures of Superboy. Just by the name of the would-be show, I think it's quite obvious that they were attempting to emulate the success of the first one. While the show was never picked up, a pilot does exist. This pilot is notable for a couple of reasons. Not only was this seemingly supposed to be a prequel to the serials that put Superman on the map of moving media, but it was also the first on-screen appearance of Superboy's sweetheart, Lana Lang, as well as Superboy himself. Though I don't know how much you want to count that, as Superboy is really just Superman sans puberty. Despite the difference in timelines, there are still some familiar faces here. Actor Charles Maxwell played the Gunner, but he'd also appeared in an episode of The Parent Show as a character named Boris. The whole story feels like a second-rate Adventures of Superman story, just now set in a small town with high school students. It was clear that this was really attempting to recapture the spirit of that first show, a fact made even that much more apparent whenever Superboy is shown soaring through the skies, running through walls, and bending steel. This almost feels like watching a cover band of your favorite group play their greatest hits. It's familiar, but it's not as familiar as you'd like. I've mentioned that this was made as a prequel to The Adventures of Superman, but there are also elements that are working against this sharing a canon with that earlier slash later show. In The Adventures of Superman, Clark's Earth parents are credited as Eben and Sarah Kent, just as they were named in The Adventures of Superman radio show, whereas here they're referred to as Jonathan and Martha Kent, as they're called in the comics. So strangely enough, this first and last episode focuses heavily on an unknown classmate of Clark's, Jimmy Drake. 
it does seem a little weird naming a one-off side character Jimmy when Superman's best bud is also named Jimmy. Especially for a time when naming conventions were definitely way overthought. Like much later in 1989, one of the alleged reasons that Harvey Bullock didn't show up in those Batman movies was out of fear of confusing the audience because they had already had a Harvey in Harvey Dent. Two of them, actually. In the first movie, he was swapped out with Lieutenant Eckhart. And while the character was initially written into the sequel script, he was credited as Eddie Bullock before eventually he'd wind up getting removed. Sorry for that tangent there, I'm just saying it seems strange that they decide to use the name Jimmy when there was already a very famous Jimmy within Superman lore. Anyway, this Jimmy, who is not Jimmy Olsen, is ashamed of his father's profession as a doorman. And for some reason, that makes him a laughingstock amongst his classmates. I do think this pilot offers a good lesson to see the person and not the profession. Sure, his father doesn't have the most glamorous job, but his occupation doesn't determine his worth. He was a loving and caring father, a hardworking man doing whatever he could to raise his son and provide him with a better life. Despite being a single parent, he works the job that he does to provide a better future for his son. But the downside of this is that it feels like this lesson could have been learned without the inclusion of Superboy. When Jimmy gets home and voices his dismay, his father handles his disappointment relatively well. He explains that everything he does is for the betterment of his child, and that hopefully, when he gets a job, he can get a better one than him. Sounds good enough, right? Well, it should be. Instead, despite seemingly resolving this issue very early on, the boy only appreciates his father when he's able to help the one-day Superman apprehend criminals, a couple of crooks who seek to steal rare jewels from Jimmy's father's place of work. Now, in regards to Superman's predecessor and the real-life actor's successor, I wouldn't say that he was all that successful. Case in point, this series not being picked up. What I will say, however, about actor Johnny Rockwell is that he had a great look. And name, but that's completely unrelated. He certainly looks like a young Superman. And I'll even say some of the time, he kind of sounds like a young George Reeves. But whenever he was out of costume, he was out of character, and more importantly, out of his element. His take on Clark Kent certainly isn't as memorable as George Reeves. A lot of the time, he comes off as bland, boring, and... Well, just bored. Still, I think he did a good job with what was given, at least on the hero side of things. He looked and sounded like a young Superman, but he never felt like a young Clark Kent. Even in paying him a compliment in his Superman performance, I will say that a lot of the time it comes off as an impersonation of his predecessor. One that works half the time, but also doesn't the other half. Though I think it's important to remember that he only had one opportunity to perfect the part. More often than not, the first episode isn't the final performance. Portrayals are not properly finalized in their debut. This was a strong start, and I think if the actor was awarded enough time, this would only improve with each new outing. So it's really hard to rag on an actor for not filling out the boots of an icon when he was only afforded 20-something minutes to do so, and the other was given over a hundred episodes in a serial. Replacing love interest Lois Lane is high school sweetheart Lana Lang. Man, this guy, this guy just loves alliteration. Something about those double L's, they're the loves of his life. Lois Lane, Lana Lang, Lex Luthor, all the greatest loves of Superman's life. Lana doesn't get to do a lot, but I think the actress makes a good enough impression. She's good in the part, but the part itself isn't all that good. While she means well, the character can come off as a little bit snobby with how quickly she gets annoyed and decides to criticize Clark. Again, it's well acted, but the character itself is definitely not fully realized here. There are a lot of elements to this episode that are laughable in hindsight, and I'm not just talking about all that's dated. There are things that probably would have been laughed at at the time this came out, or was supposed to come out. These three goons are planning on robbing the place where Jimmy's father works. And in order to do so, they got plastic surgery so they wouldn't be recognized. Which makes you think, A, where did they get the money for this procedure? Seems quite pricey, especially back then. And I kind of think you would need money in order to get that surgery. And I get that you have to spend money to earn money, but 
that just feels like way too much of a gamble. You're spending way too much money and uh, there's a chance that you're not gonna get it back. And B, is it really worth it to completely change your identity just to be unidentifiable? Their plan also feels a little bit out of whack. They have a guy on lookout who is meant to shoot at the police to distract Superboy. And they're telling him he'll only do three months in jail. Man, I, I, I don't know what rules there were in the 1950s, but I have to imagine that even given the different time, that's way off base. Also, it's really just a good guess that the officer would ring in the cape rather than call in the squad. There's also this glowing lamp that signals to Superboy when someone's in danger. A police officer will radio it in and then Clark Kent's light bulb starts blinking. I don't know the exact science or technology behind that one, that seems a little bit weird. What's most interesting about this series though, is that while it was never picked up and remained unaired until it was unearthed, someone clearly saw some merit in it. As the unreleased pilot was actually repurposed and its story was turned into an issue of the Superboy comic. Pretty much beat for beat. Just swapping out Jimmy Drake with Tommy Hunter. Probably because like what I said before, that would be one Jimmy too many. Tommy's ashamed of his doorman father until he finds a way to help Superboy out. Sound familiar? Well, it should, because that's literally what we've been talking about this whole time. As a matter of fact, while only one episode was shot for this series, several scripts were written. And out of the 13, at least one or two of them were recycled into the Superboy comic run. This footage was made widely available with the release of the Smallville box set, which contained this unpicked pilot as a bonus feature. It's interesting to think of what could have been. While this certainly wasn't anything groundbreaking, I do think it held its own and with time and dedication, probably would have spawned a fan base, or at least aped off an already existing one. I'm actually surprised that this pilot was passed on. The Adventures of Super Pup, as fun as that was, made sense to me. That's, that's nightmare fuel brought here into reality. I am not surprised that that one got locked away, never to see the light of day. If there was a fan base for that, it was probably niche back in the day. But this? I'm gonna say it, I think this one probably could have worked. In short, the adventures of Superboy fell so that Superboy and Smallville could fly. You have so much potential. I hate to see it go to waste. I have a really fun piece of what the fuck trivia for ya. Currently, it's an exciting time to be a superhero fan. And it's actually an exciting time to be a Smallville fan. As I've recently discussed on this channel, a sequel to Smallville is currently in the works. That's right, 11 years later, we're finally getting a season 11. So, if all goes well, we should be seeing a Smallville animated series sometime soon. But did you know that there was almost a Smallville spin-off that was set to coexist alongside the original? An Aquaman series, nonetheless. Which makes sense, as the character was set up and established on that show during its fifth season, making his first appearance in an episode appropriately titled, Aqua. Arthur, or as he's known here, AC, comes to Smallville to stop, and, and I want you to know I'm not making this, I'm literally reading the official description here, to stop an underwater weapons project being developed by Luther Corp. Because of course. In this episode, Aquaman becomes Awkward Man, as after saving Lois from drowning, he proceeds to then try to drown her with his tonsils the rest of the episode. And that's mostly it, that's the plot. That's the episode's plot. This episode, for one reason or another, drew pretty high ratings, and this gave those in charge the immediate idea to create a spin-off series starring the character. So you may be thinking to yourselves, oh, okay, a show starring Aquaman actor Alan Richson, right? WRONG! Because despite being cast in the role in Smallville, the network felt that he was too green to carry a series on his own. So he was immediately brought in to be Aquaman, but then relieved of his Aquaman duties right quick. So in his place, the show cast Justin Hartley. Yes, that Justin Hartley. Mm -hmm. The guy who would just one season later go on to become the Green Arrow on Smallville. What do you mean? Here, Green Arrow is Aquaman, as opposed to on Smallville, where Aquaman was actually Hawk from Titans. What do you mean? Even more interesting is that Justin Hartley was cast as Green Arrow on Smallville, while Alan Richson was brought back in to continue to portray Aquaman on that series anyway. What do you mean? You process this however you need to process it. If you want to keep talking in a person. Tell me about a, a, a 
pilot you did mm -hmm. that didn't get picked up, that you love? Aquaman, it's gotta be. How pissed were you when Justin Hartley played Aquaman in the spinoff and you didn't? I played Aquaman. No, I wasn't mad at all. Like, why didn't they consider you? And at the time, UPN and Warner Brothers had merged to create the CW and the president of the UPN had taken over. And he goes, he can't have his own show. Justin Hartley just came off Passions and uh, he's available and we're gonna go with Justin Hartley. And I was like, <sighs> I don't know who that is, but great. And I thought it had legs, it was really well written. This is just really a whole thing already. But it gets even weirder when you realize that a whole bunch of the actors involved in this Aquaman pilot had either already or would go on to make appearances on Smallville. The actress who played Nadia, Adrienne Palicki, also played Kara the Kryptonian in Season 3 of Smallville. PROOF! The actress who played Lieutenant Rachel Torres in the show also played Angel of Vengeance in Season 5 of Smallville. Admiral Brigman in the show was played by Rick Peters, who had a pretty memorable role in the first season of Smallville as Bob Rickman, a man who had the gift of the gap. And that gift came from Meteorite, as so many gifts on the show do. Kenny Johnson played a sheriff on Aquaman, and Tommy Lee on Smallville. No, 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 not that Tommy Lee. Definitely not, definitely not that Tommy Lee either. There you go, that's the one, there's a boy. Jesse from the pilot was also Jacob Finley on Smallville. Amber McDonald, who played Eva in the pilot of this series, also played the Poison Ivy-inspired Gloria on Smallville as well. So already this tie-in is using a whole bunch of familiar faces, but with different names. The show did have some star power attached to it, with Lou Diamond Phillips stepping in as Arthur's adoptive father, Tom Curry, and Ving Rhames, well, pretty much just being Ving Rhames. What else is he gonna do? Outside of detailing the strangeness that surrounds this never-aired, never-picked-up pilot and the very odd factoids of its existence, there's really not a whole lot to talk about. The first and only episode was beyond bland and mind-numbingly dull. There's just not a whole lot going for it. It doesn't really do a great job of explaining its own existence, and I think that's probably because it's supposed to be shaded in this veil of mystery. The audience is supposed to be curious and longing to know more about AC's backstory. And considering the show never got a season 2, or actually let alone an episode 2, clearly they weren't. I'm actually really surprised in hearing that despite WB passing on the show, it was mostly well received. That's sort of hard for me to imagine. Because while I love Smallville, this Aquaman show just was kind of a whole lot of nothing. I can see that it's definitely attempting to follow the Smallville motif, but it just comes up a little bit short for me. Maybe it's because Aquaman is aggressively uninteresting to me unless he's done right. And he's not the easiest character to get right, like, like it's, it's much easier to do it wrong. And seeing the character under the whole surfer frat brat guys just kind of feels a little bit lame. I get that it was done in Smallville, and I do find it a little bit less embarrassing there, but I think that's only for the fact that everything with Aquaman on that show was kind of just done in passing. Like, we don't, we don't see a whole lot of him or his backstory or what his day-to-day -day life is like, and because of that, it's more tolerable. Here, like, just watching a bunch of white dudes named Brad and Chad and Derek running around with their gelled up hair and wearing shark teeth for necklaces, I don't know, I just, I don't, it, yeah, yeah. Not for me. I also feel like this might be a little bit too much like Smallville, and whether that's by design or coincidence, I'm not sure. There's a bunch of things that link this pilot to the pilot of Smallville. The whole losing a parent and having to stay with an adoptive parent, following a natural disaster that isn't actually as natural as one might think. You know, there's, it's similar. There's some similarities here. This pilot almost feels like the Smallville pilot, but just with a different skin. Yes, I understand both of these events are part of those characters' histories. I'm just saying that, in practice, it rings a little bit familiar. Also, there's something about the Florida beach aesthetic that is so... boring to me. I mean, I used to live in Florida. It's beautiful. I love it, love the beaches, people not so much, but the place looks lovely. It's great to vacation in. But it doesn't really make for the best background for a supposedly dramatic series. I came here to watch Aquaman, not Summerland. Although I do like the lighthouse. I, I, I'm fond of lighthouses, so personal points there. Arthur, or as he's known in the Smallville universe, AC, AC and his mother are flying over the Bermuda Triangle, as you do, when they're struck down by a cyclone, as it does. 
His mother is kidnapped by the real-life Little Mermaid, who is looking significantly less adorable when she's not a Disney mascot. And Arthur, or Orin as his mother calls him in this, survives after being handed a seahorse necklace. Mom, look, I know your heart's in the right place, but that's a really shitty gift for him to remember you by. Kid's not gonna look down at that and remember you, he's gonna look at it and remember that one episode of Spongebob. Ten years later, Arthur, who was ten in the flashback and now almost thirty somehow, is still mystified by the disappearance of his mother, bringing it up every chance that he gets. But when the guy isn't reliving the trauma he experienced as a child, he's saving people and fish people alike. Meanwhile, a man is picked up in the ocean near the Bermuda Triangle, talking about warning Orin. Oh, and he also has a matching seahorse necklace. Actually, now that I think of that, where was that necklace in that episode of Smallville? I don't remember him having embarrassing seahorse accessories. PROOF! Aquaman's only had one appearance before and we're already retconning everything from what he was wearing down to who's portraying him. Nadia, the not-so-little mermaid previously mentioned, returns and tries to seduce AC into his early lateness. But he's saved by Ving Rhames, who is another Atlantean, who reveals to him his destiny of being Waterman. And now, the pilot AC saved during the pilot is now working with a group who is investigating the abnormal returns of people from the Bermuda Triangle. Nadia the Siren returns again at the end, almost kills Arthur's friend, who would have undoubtedly turned into his love interest, but is ultimately defeated. The end. I don't think any of this was bad, per se, but it felt really... bleh. You know, like, I could take it or leave it, and honestly, I'm pushing more toward leaving it. It's not terrible. It's definitely not the worst thing that's been done with the Aquaman character, but it's far from the best thing that's been done with the Aquaman character. I'm really grateful that this pilot was made, but I'm also really grateful that this show was never picked up. On one hand, oof, I'm, I'm sorry, Arthur. B bad phrasing on my part. My apologies. The show seemed like it was a little bit too campy, although it also seemed like they were trying to take themselves very seriously, but they were failing. It almost comes off like Diet Smallville. The content was clearly taking itself seriously, but it really shouldn't have for the way that it was presented. The show in concept almost felt like Baywatch meets Baywatch Nights. The beach setting and surfer aesthetic is just such a weird attempt at modernizing Aquaman and making him more digestible for a viewing audience that I feel like in trying to legitimize and potentially pander to a younger demographic, they just made the whole thing even more goofy and completely unrelatable. However, it was Hartley's brief time in the role of Aquaman that earned him the role of Green Arrow, which I think the guy really nailed. So there was definitely good that came with the bad. Of course, this also created a monster because Justin Hartley was apparently not happy enough with only playing two of DC's greatest, and he eventually managed to do what Tom Welling couldn't do in 11 seasons by playing Superman. If there was ever a DC Hall of Fame, Justin Hartley has certainly earned his place in it. Ultimately, I'm happy that Justin was given the role of Green Arrow, and I'm glad that Alan Richson was able to return to the role of Aquaman. It just feels like everything worked out for the better that way. All in all, I think this is one superhero show that I'm actually glad wasn't picked up. I am vengeance. I am the knight. And that was V Infuso. Just remember, if you're not tuning in, then you're missing out. So, if you like the words that came out of his mouth hole, and you too would like to become a V-generate. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks for watching, nerds! And if you're not joining the fun, you're in for one bad day. And you know what they say about having one bad day. <laughs> Catch him next time. Same bad time. Same bad channel.